Axel. Used to play. He used to call it Axel. Axel. Oh, Axel. Axel. Yeah. Um, it, uh, it's got a long history. This is Jan, by the way. It's, I'll introduce her for you. <laughs> Jan's the lady that asked me to come tonight. Well, very glad you're here. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, it's an all time record Hi. again. Do you want this way? Yeah, yeah, like. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Can you hear me now? No. Yes. no. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me? No. Turn it on. 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 And this is even bigger at 48 people, I think, in the room, possibly more. Um, so thank you very much for coming out tonight. And um, the first thing I want to say is tonight's talk is about war to them, the last war. And as I, I know, I can't think there's anybody in this room who's not aware of what's going on in Eastern Europe as we speak. So I hope that you will remember those people in your thoughts and prayers. But we're going to go back a bit to 1940s. Uh, and I'm very pleased to welcome Ross Stewart, who is the uh, curator of the museum at Weatherstead Museum. And he's going to talk for about an hour or so. Um, and then we did have a short talk by um, the Scott Weatherstead Airfield um, Prison. And that's about the future, but it's, it is relevant. Uh, we'll have a break, a tea break, at the end of the talk rather than halfway through, as there's a large amount of people. Yeah, to serve the disease. So if you want to stay at the end of the talk and discuss things with Ross or amongst yourself and have a coffee at the same time, you're welcome to. Um, anyone who needs toilets, it's through that left-hand door past the kitchen. And uh, I'd like to say welcome to our friends in America. Could you have the mic a bit nearer? They've got it here in America. Welcome to our friends in America who are with us via Zoom. Okay, so over to Ross. Okay, thank you, thank you, Jack. Um, I'll be here at the end when you're having a cup of tea, and uh, quite happy to answer questions or listen to any stories. Because the more stories we hear, if you've got them, uh, put all together, it helps to build the museum and build the picture and the history. Anyway, I'm Ross Stewart. As Jan said, I'm the curator of Wellersfield Airfield Museum. And I think Pete will put my presentation up or it'll be difficult for me to get through. <laughs> okay. And uh, I put this picture up because it's got Castle Heading on it. And those are the A20s from World War II flying back from a mission. Round about, round about April sometime in 1944. Um, and Jan copied some off. So I put that just as a, a, a little start up. Um, and the, the next one's really this one about me. I used to be in the MOD police at Wethersfield. I actually went there in 1991 and several times up to 2000. In 2000, I came to Wethersfield to live and I lived there up until 2012 when I retired as a chief inspector in the information, the information department. During that time that I was there, I got interested in the history. And really what I'm going to do is tell you the story about how I got interested in the history and at the same time tell you what that history that I discovered and found out uh, about was. So that's what we'll, we'll do. Oh, and we've lost the presentation. All right. I'm just uh, putting up so they, so they can see in America. All right. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's the introduction done. Um, as I said, I moved there in 2000. I really didn't get interested in the history until 2008. Oh, the clicker's not working on that one. Try now. That's it. So, and this is what got me interested. The land wasn't the airfield. It wasn't the 
all about the wars and uh, World War II and the people that was there. I was interested in the land and the farms that were there, and, and that interested me. And one day, and you can see that's what was there. You can see part wood that was there, um, the, the big wood up the top in the center. And that was the kind of key part of that piece of land. So it's not working again now. Uh, no. Okay. That's it. <clears throat> and you can still see hardwood there. Now, the original hardwood was 100 acres that you saw on the last slide. If I just quickly go back, it's 100 acres. And to build the airfield, to build the runway, they took out 70 acres. So there's only 30 acres left there. Um, but you can see it's still basically farmland. It's still land. And it was interesting. In 2008, I was taking the dog for a walk. You can see how many airfields uh, were up there as well. And Weathersfield's at the bottom where the blue aeroplane is. You can see Gosfield nearby. The gentleman was just talking to me about Andrews Field. That was World War II. That was all the airfields that were in the East Anglia area in this area. Well, I was walking the dog in 2008. I was up the far, far end of the, the airfield and we were walking along here. And this caught my eye, this bit here. And I found this interesting. Why did they build the fence like that? Yeah. And why did they build the fence like that? So let's have a closer look at it. There was obviously something in there at some point. So I started to research that. And that was, and if you look at this, you can see, you can see a distinctive shape of the road, a V shape in that road. And that was the two roads that used to go to Gainsford then um, from Weathersfield village area um, back before the airfield was built. But in, what, what I discovered was in 1957, when they got the supersonic jets that we'll talk about later, they had to extend the runway to make it longer for the jets to be able to take off. And in 1957, what they done was, they just built the fence around the house that was there. And that house was Hawks Hall. And Hawks Hall was originally recorded as being there in 1066. It was built there, it was called Havesale back then, it was a French name, because it was the home of the Norman Baron, Baron that William, William the Conqueror, he gave that Baron the three fields, the Toppest Field, Weathersfield, Finchon Field, and he gave him that land for all the troops and all the effort he put in to help the Normans when they fought the Saxons in 1066. And he built his house there. And through the years, it developed, and you can find the history of the house, uh, the last thing in 1957 was the Grim, David Grimwood, one of the, the, the Grimwood family were and, and are still one of the well-known farm families around the airfield area. David Grimwood lived there and, um, and it was given to the Americans and the Americans, they just built around it. So that's how that big fence was there. That's how I got interested. So I was really more interested about the fields and the farm and the, the land that was there. And through that, I did start to get interested in what about the airplanes that came and what about the war. Um, so I then started to find out about the first Americans that arrived. They arrived in February 1944. The airfield started to be built in 1942. It should have been ready in 1943. It should have been ready for the big B-17 bombers that were at Ridgewell. They wanted to could bring more of those, but Ridgewell couldn't cope with them out with, with another plot. So they were going to put them down to Weathersfield. And it was going to be joint. It was going to be a satellite station of Ridgewell. And they were going to put B-17 bombers. But by the time they ran out of materials and they, they didn't finish the airfield. And by the time they did finish it in 19, at the end of 1943, by the time they did finish it, they stopped using the B-17 as much and they had a different tactic of warfare and they were using smaller, lighter bombers to just go over to France. So the bomb bombers that they put in 
to here were the 416th bomb group. And there was about 2,000 men arrived here. They arrived at the Colne Valley uh, Railway Station um, from Greenock. They came over on a ship to Greenock in Scotland, um, came down by train, and then they were taken in trucks and they went up there. So there was 2,000 Americans arrived in February 1944. They only stayed till September and they carried out 140 missions. We'll talk about them and some of the men. That was the commander, Colonel, Colonel Harold Mace, that I've put up in the picture there. So many men that we could talk about. I'm going to talk about one or two of them. Four squadrons that they had at the bottom uh, from the 668 squadron to 671 squadron at the end at the same with the, the, the bomb and the, the snake, the winged snake. One of the men I'm going to talk about is William Cramsey, Lieutenant William Cramsey. Uh, because, and the reason I'm going to talk about him is because in 2010, so two years after I got interested in the history, a gentleman turned up at Weathersfield, an American, and he was a retired Air Force captain, American Air Force captain. He had, in 2008, been given this ring that you can see in the picture up there. And the ring had an inscription in it with William Edward Cramsey, and he was quite intrigued by it. So he wanted to look into him. And the man that was in the top left hand corner, that you see a small picture of, is um, Wayne Sales. Wayne had written a number of books about uh, yeah. collecting coins and gold coins uh, and and ancient coins. And he was actually in London giving a talk about that very subject. He took the chance to come up to Weathersfield. And he brought six of his books with him and he came on to Weathersfield. Well, they thought, well, who's going to talk to this man? He wants to talk about World War II. So they found me to talk, talk to him about World War II. And I was able to answer some of his questions because I'd started to research it by then. But Wayne and I became good friends from then, and we emailed each other probably every every week anyway since 2010, and you'll see why. He left six books. One of the books that he left was put in the waiting room at the chief consul's office, and you must have had to wait in there a long time because there's a stack of books in there that you could read. <laughs> and, uh, but. The deputy chief consul, you can see in the middle of the picture at the bottom, Jer Jerry McCauley, um, was a, a person that I'd come up through the force with. He had read the book, he was interested uh, uh, in history and, uh, and he found it very interesting. And he called me up one day and he asked me to go and speak to him. He said, Ross, I've read this book, um, first of all, about William Cramsey. And I, I'm not sure that that airplane couldn't be found because Bill Cramsey, on the 10th of April, 1944, Easter Monday, he flew to France with the unit, 36 airplanes, and three, two didn't come back. Three were hit and, and lost engines. One went down in France, has never been found. The other one landed at Bradwell Bay, and, <clears throat> and Bill Cramsey's airplane was hit and was on its way back to Wethersfield with one engine, um, but he disappeared and never been found, and still never been found as yet. Um, but from reading the book, the deputy chief consul said, I think that airplane could be found. What do you think? Let's see what we can do. And through him, we went and talked to the uh, General Third Air Force at Lake and Heath. And he put us on a video call to the Pentagon, and we talked about looking for the airplane and opening up the case. And we did open up the case. And the other people in the picture you can see are some of my team uh, from the police at Weathersfield. And the three civilians are people from the JPAC, as they were known at that time, the, the Joint Prisoner and Missing Person, Missing Airman um, Unit in the Pentagon. So we set up a search for click it. There you yeah. go, thank you. And we set up a search for uh, to try and find out what happened to Bill Cramsey. And what I do know is we had all the mission and we had all the paperwork from there that they flew down over Dover. They went over to a place called Haysbrook in France, it's just south of the bit south of Paris, and they were bombing a V1 site because that was their main job was marshal yards 
um, um, ammunition depots and V1 sites, but their main job was V1 uh, sites. And they bombed the V1 site here. And you can see this is possibly from the date. One of them's got an engine out. Um, so they've got to fly back over Dunkirk, back to North Foreland, and then back to Weathersfield. Now, the report for Bill Cramsey says that he went missing here because he made an emergency radio call for a landing at Bradwell Bay. But so did another pilot called Scotty Street, who was a friend of his. And Scotty landed at Bradwell Bay. And he said at the same time as he made his call, he heard the other pilot, Bill Cramsey, make his call. And he looked down because he said he was at 300 feet and Scotty was at 2,000 feet and they were in the same place. And he looked down, he saw. And he said that when they made the radio call, they were actually about here. So I got all the paperwork and I went through it. And one day I realized when I was reading the paperwork that the position had been taken from the radio call, but the person who had written it down had possibly written the number wrong. And you know, if you write a telephone number or you're writing any kind of number down or anything, you get confused, you get distracted by somebody, you go back to, and they wrote five zero. And I think they should have written zero five. And it's called number inversion. So that's where five zero is here. And if you change the five zero at the end to zero five, it puts it right there. So I had a thought, I'll have a look at that area. And there's Pete there. Ready to click. Next one. Next one. Sorry, just say next. Next, <laughs> yeah. It's gonna be easier than next. <clears throat> So I had a look, I had a look to see if there was anything there. And lo and behold, that's five zero, that's zero five. And I found on a rec site chart, and you can't read this, but I'm going to tell you what's in there. It tells me in 1947, a Spitfire was flying over there, taking photographs, and it, uh, uh, and it saw a, a, an aircraft wreck. And, took, and there was a photograph taken. It was taken again in 1966. I found the photograph because it had the number of the photographs. So being in the MOD at the time, I was able to go and dig out the MOD files and dig out that actual photograph. And that's the actual photograph <coughs> there. And it's this tiny speck. But when you enlarge it, you can clearly see that there's an aeroplane here mm -hmm. and possibly two engines. And that's the type of aeroplane that Bill Cramsey was in. It was an A-20 Havoc. The British, the RAF, British people called them the Boston, the Douglas Boston. The Americans called it the A-20 Havoc. And to me, it looks like that could possibly be it. So that was in 1966 that photograph was taken. So, and he's not too far away. There's Bradwell Bay on the land here. And that's roughly where the airplane wreck would be that was taken in the photograph. So we go next. Uh, so I went there, I kind of help of uh, uh, a, a retired policeman from the Metropolitan Police, very senior officer, Roger Gasper, and his yacht, and um, Alan Burke, who owns one of the oyster companies at Mersey Island. And Alan Burke, was an expert at walking on these sands because they're shifting sands and they're a very dangerous place to go. So they took me out there. In fact, they took me out there twice. And we found wreckage, as you can see. The thing is, the second time we went back, first time we weren't able to identify it, but the second time we went back, we were able to identify the wreckage. And it was German. It was probably a Junkers 88. And it was a German wreck. But after that second time, and this is where we went, where the Blue Triangle is, we went there, I realized that Junkers 88 should have been here at this yellow arrow. And it wasn't until after I came back in 2011 that I thought, <laughs> the German one was there in 1966, and it's now there. 40 years later, this is shifting sand. This one could be here. So can we do two clicks? And what we have is 
in that area, this is the airplane. And can you see the airplane? And, the two, and these were taken in 1971 in that area or near that area. And it still looks like the same aircraft. So I had mentioned this. And one of the problems is that a lot of divers and a lot of people in that area, they salvage from these wrecks. They shouldn't because if it is Bill Cramsey's plane, it would have been a war grave and they shouldn't be doing it. But people do go out and they take stuff from them. And, uh, and can we click again, Pete? <laughs> And somebody went there to that area, which I've never been able to go back to. And that's the wreckage that's there. Now, this piece that they've taken from it might actually hold the clue as to whether it's Bill Cramsey's airplane or not. Because on this piece, we can actually see rivets, and the rivets have got dimples in them. And the thing is, it's believed, we've not, we've not had an expert say so yet, it's believed that Americans have mm -hmm. simples, dimples uh, on, and on their rivets. The two simple ones were plain dimples and pimples. So they had some that had an indent in them and some that had a little piece sticking on the top. But the Germans and the British never done that. They just stuck rivets in because they were never intending to take them out again. The Americans wanted to know what kind of metal they'd use. And that's why they had three different types of rivet. The, the dimples on there um, are, and that fact is true, then that would say that was an American airplane, and it may well be Bill Cramsey's airplane. So his two nephews, Bob Cramsey and Tom Rickles, wrote to their uh, congressman. And the congressman happened to be, um, if we go next, Pete, the congressman had to be the leader of the Republicans at the moment, Kenneth, Kevin McCarthy. And he, I wrote a report for them I, and he read the book uh, about it and he opened up the case again. He, well, he asked the Pentagon to reopen the case up again because it got closed after I retired as a policeman. It's now been opened up again. And if we can prove that that's an American airplane there, they'll send people out to go and have a look and search for it and see. So that's the story, the second story that got me started. If we go next, Pete. There were 48 men lost their life in World War II. And um, um, I can't go, I'm not going to go through all the World War II crashes. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Cold War as well. But uh, we just do three clips on this, or two clips. Yeah, this one, that, that's fine. This one's quite famous. It's, it's in most World War II books that you'll pick up and read today. You'll see that airplane. And it's a Weathersfield airplane. We know by the white stripe on the end, and we actually know the story of this. I can tell you why I know the story of this. There was four men in that airplane, because you can see it's got glass nodes on the front, and it had a, a navigator, a bomb aimer. The front airplane of each group of nine had a glass nose and the bomb aimer, when they dropped their bombs, the other eight airplanes behind them could drop their bombs. <coughs> and that's how they, and if he, if he didn't drop his bombs, the other ones didn't drop their bombs because he didn't find the target. On this one, you can see they were shot down. Um, the, the navigator, the bomb aimer and the gunner, there was a pilot, a bomb aimer, a gunner on the top and a gunner on the bottom. The gunner on the bottom and the, and the navigator both managed to bail out and they were captured by the, the Germans and became prisoners of war. Um, the pilot had no chance to get out and it looks like from the, the way it's on fire it's been hit, the gunner on the top, he didn't make it either. So two out of the four made it and became prisoners of war. And the reason I know about that and about that thing is because the navigator, after the war, and when he was released and went back to America, he was a good friend of the pilot and his wife, and he went to see the wife and he told her the story and told her what it was like. And after a, no a number of years, they became good friends and they got married. And their son, um, and that was Albert Jednak, he married Robert Stockwell's uh, widow, and they had a son, and their son has told the story 
and um, and is you know is pleased to know that that story is in the museum at Wellersfield. Uh, uh, that has <coughs> about the, the airplane at that time. Next, <coughs> wasn't all airplanes being shot down as well. <coughs> they had a good time when they were here. Um, this is Finchin Field, Field Hall, and I've done I've done the talk in Finchin Field a few times. And one of the very first times there was a couple of ladies that said they were in that picture and they were there. Um, this bottom picture was their own club. They had a, an aero club, the officers club up at Wethersfield that they started at that time. And you're going to see in a, in a few seconds, I met some of the men that were pilots and, and engineers uh, from World War II. And I met them and asked them lots of questions and stories. I went to Washington to do a talk to them. They asked me over there uh, when I was there. One of the questions I asked them was because I was always a bit jealous of Ridgewell. Ridgewell have got wonderful photographs of in the hangar that they had Bing Crosby there. And, um, and there's about four or five photographs and there's about 4,000 people. They say that the, that the people who were there came from all over, um, as far away as the hospital at uh, Great Notley. Uh, Notley um, I think it was White Notley, they had the big American hospital at, <clears throat> to go and see Bing Crosby. I knew there were shows at Wethersfield, but I didn't really know what any of them were. So I asked those men when I was in Washington, did you see any shows? And what would this picture probably be that you're watching? And they all say, and the only one that they could really remember was Bob Hope. And I said it was one of the best shows that they'd ever seen. And they'd rather watch Bob Hope than Bing Crosby. So, so, so we do know that Bob Hope performed in World War II at Wethersfield. Next. Another person I had, I never got a chance to meet, but I was able to email with quite often. And uh, his son uh, was Captain Fran Catcher. And uh, Captain Fran Catcher, he ran the photography unit. I had about 12 photographers. And they would go in the airplanes and they'd take pictures of the bombing raids. They'd do some film and they take lots of pictures during their time. He sent 900 photographs. Those 900 photographs and a few more are on the 468.com website, uh, which is an excellent website. And you can see them all there. And then uh, Fran sent a disc over with the photographs and, and 22 minutes of black and white film from Weathersfield when they were there. I like these ones. I like the nose art on airplanes. Mm -hmm. And the nose art at Weathersfield is. It's fairly tame compared to the B-17s of Ridgewell. Um, but I love, I like this name, Boomerang, always comes back. Yeah, and I don't know the whole story of that airplane. It's something I need to check out. But uh, we we'll go next. <coughs> this one's famous, mislaid. Uh, yeah, which is a little bit more raunchy, that one. And, uh, and I don't know why they called it mislaid. But... It's quite famous, for, and if we do another clip, Pete, it was the first aircraft of its type to do 100 missions. Not only did it do 100 missions, it done it done a lot more because it, it went to France and, and it had done those 100 missions uh, well before it was finished at Wethersfield. It never broke down. It never got hit, and it had the same crew and the same engineering crew all the way through the war, right to the end of the war. Now, these men could go home after 65 missions. You've maybe seen the Memphis Bell, and it was about <coughs> crewed in their last 25th mission. The big bombers were 25, it got ramped up to a few more missions. But for these smaller bombers, with just the three men on it, um, they had to do 65 missions. So those men that you see there, they could have gone home after 65 missions, but they didn't. And they still never got hit. And they survived the war. They finished the war. At the end of the war, when the war was over, they carried on and they were dropping supplies to people that needed them, that needed food and, and, and stuff like that. They didn't go home till well after the war was over. What do we do next? It got renamed La France Libre. That's why it's famous. Because if you buy a model of that airplane now, it probably has La France Libre on it, not Miss Lee, because when they went to France, they renamed it in a big ceremony. 
They moved there in September 1944 from Wethersfield after, after um, D-Day. This one is my favourite though, Pink Lady, uh, because I've spoken with this pilot, knew him well, and I've asked him about because he didn't have bombs on his airplane. He's got whiskey balls. <laughs> and uh, the story goes, that's Wayne Downing, and the story goes, Wayne, Wayne done hundreds of missions. Uh, I think he was getting on nearly 200, but he, he didn't like to admit it because he was here before the 416th. He came right, right at the very beginning, um, uh, flying airplanes when the Americans came over. And um, but the pink lady was, uh, under the story of the whiskey pot, was his chief engineer's task every time they went on a mission was to go to one of the villages, Weathersfield, Finchinfield, Gosfield, Sybil Headingham, and get a bottle of whiskey. Now, that wasn't easy in World War II. So, how he got the bottle of whiskey would be uh, swapping a leg of lamb, lamb or, you know, or, or, or a couple of big bits of steak or something to get a bottle of whiskey. And when they came back, they'd paint the label, they'd soak the label off, they came back, they'd paint a new whiskey bottle on, they'd lacquer, they'd lacquer the label onto it, and the crew and the engineering crew would finish off the bottle of whiskey every time they come back. So the pink lady, who's the pink lady? <coughs> we go next. The pink lady is Norma. And Norma was a nurse. And, uh, and she was over in Bristol area. Uh, at the uh, Yeovil uh, area in Bristol. And um, she was in a big army host, American army hospital there. And Wayne would take his airplane and fly there to go and see her. Um, so and when, uh, when D-Day happened, Norma went over after D-Day and she set up a field hospital over there after D-Day. In fact, she's in the newspaper here for the Battle of the Bulge because she was awarded medals because she set a field hospital up at the Battle of Bulge. <clears throat> Wayne would have to fly, he flew so many missions because he'd have to fly 25 missions to get a one week pass. So for 25 missions, he never had any time off and he would do that to get a one week pass. And he told me that one week pass, he would get himself to Dover, he would use cigarettes with the sailors at Dover to get in a minesweeper across to France. And she was then based in Cherbourg. And he would go to see her in Cherbourg. And then he'd try and catch a lift home on an airplane back to Weathersfield uh, <laughs> or, or, or over this way. And he, he did that several times. Anyway, when they moved to France, they moved to Milan and Leon um, <coughs> shortly after, which was near Paris. He took a jeep and he drove off to Cherbourg to see Norma and proposed to her in October 1944. And they got married twice. They got married by the army chaplain at a chateau in France, and it tells you here at Cherbourg. They also got married, and Wayne told me, got married in the uh, Cherbourg Cathedral. He said that at the same time as we were getting married, as we were walking out, a funeral was coming into Sherburn. They said, and that was World War II for you uh, at the same time. So they were married twice. Norma, and they had a long, happy marriage. Uh, two daughters, I believe. Uh, I've met one of them at least. And uh, Norma died, I think, 2012. And Wayne died not too long ago, 2018, nearly into 2019. That Wayne died. He was 97. You see them there. Okay, next. <coughs> Another pilot that came over was Dave Andrews. And he came here to Weathersfield. I uh, took him up to Duxford, to Maddingley, and he was in the aircraft behind Bill Cramsey. So uh, I met Dave a few times and spoke with him, and he told me all about Bill Cramsey. His airplane was called Jackie because he was already married. He did his 65 missions and went home because he had a wife wait for him in America. Okay, so we move next. <clears throat> I took him into the glider school because I took him for a tour around the airbase. Now where the glider school was, is one of the big hangars you'll see it later, was actually where the um, his airplane was in World War II. What amazed them was there were 10 of his airplane in World War II in that hangar. And when we were there, there were 10 gliders in that hangar. 
Another thing is quite amazing is that he was in the 416th in World War II, and the glider team that were up there, the glider school, were called the 614, the opposite way around. I always find those little coincidences quite, quite amazing. I took him in there thinking we'd be in there 10 minutes. I asked George, the CEO, I asked George, is it okay if I bring this old gentleman? He was here in World War II, mm -hmm. is it just to show him around because they were busy, they were doing stuff. I uh, went in an hour and a half later. You can see that they gave him a cup of tea, sat well through photographs with him, and an hour and a half later, when we came out of there, he had a great time. That was a, a, a very good day. George actually, I, unknown to the rest of us, had his mobile phone on and he recorded because the cadets had lots of questions for him and he recorded it all. He's going to send it over to me shortly. He said he still got it. Okay, next. And this is when I went to Washington to talk to them. And there's five of them there. There's Dave Andrews. Bob Kerr was 103 when that photograph was taken. Roland Dolnick today is 101. He's the only one still alive. The others have passed away. And um, Wayne Downing there. And Joe, Joe uh, Mayers. And Joe told me some fantastic stories about when he was here. So I've got lots of stories from all of them. I've got to put down and get into the museum. You can see, and I love Wayne down here with his lollipop. But Bob Kerr's 103 years old, and look at that stare on his face because he's saying to me, you people over there must never forget the people that lost their lives over there. And that's what the museum's about, and that's what we're about doing. And uh, so we go next. Local artist in Braintree, Chris French. I don't know if any of you know him or have heard of Chris. Uh, Chris, has, uh, he's, if you go on his website, Chris, uh, Chris French, uh, aviation artist, he's got some fantastic uh, paintings there. He's uh, three paintings that he's done from Wethersfield. He came up to the museum, got some of the stories, and he got the Miss Lake story. And he thought about DK, and we talked about DK, and he made this painting, which you can buy as a print. Um, all, all his paintings, you can buy them as prints. I think they're about £28 from, from his website on in Braintree. And he done this painting of Miss Lake coming home <coughs> after DK. She's got her DK stripes on there, and she's not quite done 100 missions at that time. So fairly accurate because he would sit and work out how many missions had she done by the time she went on D-Day, et etc. And you can see the airfield, big piece of lovely green land underneath. That's how they would have seen it. Next. After they left in September, the RAF came in. And the RAF came in with this airplane here, the Stirling. So there's La France Libre, they went off to France in October, in September 23rd. In October the 9th, I think it was, the, the Stirlings came in. There was two squadrons, one number six and 299 squadron. They had a special job. They didn't go and bomb Germany or anywhere. They carried SAS, they carried supplies for the resistance, and they carried spies. And they carried the SOE, they were called back then, the Special Operations Executive. And those spies were trained at Audley End House over by Saffron Walden. And they would come and they would fly from Wethersfield. And, and we got all the love books for them, so we're able to read and see uh, where the two people out and they parachuted out. And they would take the SES out and they'd parachute into uh, behind lines to do their missions. The SAS were based at Wethersfield. That's going to come up at the end, and you'll see why that's going to come up at the end again. Next, one crew in particular of the Stirling was Bittersweet. The airplane was called Bittersweet. You're going to see that Chris French was quite taken by that story, and he's done a picture of Bittersweet. I'm in contact with the families of all those men. In fact, this one, Tony, or his real name was Albert, but on the back of the photographs that I had, it had Tony for sale. Uh, his family might be watching in Australia, and they know this story. And I couldn't find them. 
I couldn't find him or the family. He was still alive when I did eventually find them because his name wasn't Tony. I thought it was A Purcell on all the things that I found. Anthony, it was Alba. So they were able to ask him. Um, he was in a care home by the time we, we, we found and he hadn't told his family anything about World War II, as a lot of people did at that time, especially in Australia, because in Australia, um, it wasn't talked about because of being in bombers and bombing civilians in Germany. The Australians didn't really like the idea that their people were doing that. But Tony, anyway, the reason Tony was written on the back of the photograph was because they went to village hall to that one of those dances, the one in Wethersfield, and the chap in the middle, Tom Mauser, the navigator, Tom met a girl there, and they went as a two, twosome, and Tom really liked his girl, in fact, he married her, and you're going to see that next. But Tony didn't. So when the girl asked what his name was, he said, oh, it's Tony, because there was no Tony in the squadron. So if she ever came up looking for him and said, <laughs> Does anybody know where Tony is? So we don't know Tony. And that's how uh, Tony, because it backfired on him, because everybody in the squadron from that day on called him Tony. He never told his family he was called Tony. And they called him Aldi, Albert. And you can see they're from you. They're from Australia, Canada. The pilot was from Canada, and they were British. All right. So next, <clears throat> and here you can see, this is the wedding certificate. Because it was during the war, and that was permission for him to marry Frida King from Wethersfield. She lived in the council houses up, which are the row of houses that are up by where the fire station in Wethersfield is. And she lived there. Frida, uh, when she first met him, was just 18 or just a bit over 18, and she worked in the silk factory in Braintree. And she was an inspector of parachute silk. And obviously she made her wedding dress from parachute silk. And when she passed away, um, and Tom had passed away quite a while ago, and well, when she passed away, her two daughters contacted me and told me about the wedding dress and told me the story and sent me the photographs of Bittersweet and the crew. So we've got about 50 photographs from that time. And um, the, the wedding dress is now in the museum at Braintree. Uh, it's quite valuable. It was something that Braintree Museum wanted to display. Uh, that was their airplane, um, bittersweet. Next, <clears throat> another pilot who was a local man was Barry Webb. Barry lived in Finchingfield and he married um, the Whiffins Coaches. He married the daughter from Whiffins Coaches, uh, Ailey. And they ran a pub after the war. Um, and for quite a long, long time, mm -hmm. called the Nose Bag uh, in Finchinfield. And Barry was well known there. He also had, Barry had a lot to do with the Americans after the war because when the war finished, they wanted, they, they offered, he was a sergeant pilot, flying officer. And when the war finished, they offered him a commission to be a pilot and to train to be an officer pilot. He turned it down. So they gave him a job as the catering manager at Weathersfield. And that's what he ended up being. I think that's how he ended up running the pub. We were lucky before Barry passed away in 2018, he visited the museum twice and his family have passed on to us lots of artifacts he had in there on display in the museum. We go next. <clears throat> and another Chris French airplane uh, painting the print bittersweet, the rain's pouring down because they were all in air October, November, December, in January they left and they went up to Shepherd's Grove by um, by Bury St Edmunds because it rained so heavy and these airplanes were so big that they ripped up the runway. So next, <clears throat> well in March the runway had been repaired and the last time it was ever used in World War II was they had the C-47s came over for one big operation and they had the, the gliders and they had about 70 gliders there that they took the troops across for the last big operation in World War II, crossing the Rhine Operation Varsity. I was talking to John earlier um, and I'd spoken with John Fimbo who were 
all, all around eight, nine years old at the time when we go up the airfield, and John was remembered, these gliders, there was no guards, there was nobody there, they were sitting in a field outside the airfield, and these kids, like John, when they were eight, nine years old, they would get in them and pretend that they were in the war, and they'd sit in the front, pretend they were pilots, and then somebody would run to the back of it, and it would tip up the way, so they were flying up, and then somebody would run to the other end, and it would tip back down again. And uh, that's what the kids did in World War II. Next. So after World War II, 1940, uh, 1945, when that was the last mission from there, um, Chipperfield Circus moved in and they rented the airfield right up until 1951. And they brought all the circuses here in the winter and that's where they housed them. There's lots of great stories about tigers escaping and being in the local area and uh, and all sorts of animals and snakes. And, and, and they say that when the Americans say that when they were clearing out the, the hangars for use again in the Gold War, they would find snake skins and all sorts of things in there. So next, <coughs> but the Americans came back in 1952 and it was a World Warrior base at that time. So they had to start to rebuild it and put new, new buildings in. And here they're building their new headquarters building. That building's still there today. And they're building the chapel. 1952, it was completed in 1953. And in fact, one of the ladies that's watching from America, her father was a chaplain or the vicar in that chapel, an American serviceman. And her and her brothers um, have told me some stories about their time uh, at being at Weathersfield. And we gather, it's all very personal the stories that we get from people telling us and sending us stuff. In fact, tonight, a couple of people have brought in some things for us. Uh, that I've never seen before. So they had jets, but not this jet, but that was, I put him on there because that was Colonel Tolliver. He's one of the well-known officers that was there that was in command. And they had to rebuild this. So they, they, they built a lot of new buildings. So if we go next, <clears throat> the first airplane was the Thunder Street uh, F-84. It carried a nuclear bomb. It wasn't a fantastic airplane, um, but it was the first ones with nuclear bombs that were over here. And it had been for five years till 1957. Next. And then in 1957, remember, going back to Hawks Hall, why it was knocked down, because it extended the runway, because they brought this airplane in, the F-100. And it was supersonic. It, that, it could fly faster than the speed of sound. And it also carried a nuclear bomb. Uh, and um, and there's, there's stories, there's newspaper stories of windows being broken. Um, Spain's Hall is one of the famous ones because it was a 15th century window that was broken when the, the airplane went over the supersonic uh, and, uh, <clears throat> blast came from it and rattled all the windows. So next. And then we have another um, Chris French picture. This one was the first one that he'd done of Weathersfield uh, quite a long time ago. Um, he went to school in Braintree and his friend at school in Braintree, his father was in the, um, an American serviceman. And he painted this picture from photographs that, um, that his friend John had. And that would have been the father in the, um, in the cockpit as an engineer testing the airplane. Okay, next. <clears throat> One of those, that, the, the F-100, we have 10, 10 of them crashed fatally in this area. Yeah? In fact, particularly this area is the one I'm going to talk about. It's the crash of the 10 Hill Swapper. Some of, some of you will know it. Is, is Stephen here, Steve Thomas? No? So you'll see we got parts of the airplane because one of the men from the village, Steve Thompson, and um, Andrew Cox, uh, one of the people that works on the, on the farms, he does work for the farmers, have picked up parts of the airplane. They brought them to the museum. 1957, December the 2nd, Lieutenant Bill Swafford, a young man again. You know, Bill Cramsey was only 24. Bill Swafford was only about 24 years old. Um, he took off, and I've not got the first half of it on here, 
he took off, and by the time he got to the end of the runway, there was a big flash on his airplane, and it had gone on fire. He didn't know that. He couldn't see that from inside his cockpit, but the control tower saw it as he left the runway. And they radioed him and told him, but by this time he's already taken off and he's left Weathersfield and he's heading to Civil Heading. So they told him, and by the time he gets to number five, and here's Civil Heading, and here is Civil Heading, number six. By the time he gets to number five, they told him, you're not going to get out of this. You're going to have to eject and ditch your um, fuel tank and he had a dummy bomb that he was going to be dropping on the target out in the North Sea. I said, you're going to have to ditch them and eject. But he knew that if he ejected here, his plane was going to crash into this village. So he didn't. He dropped the dummy bomb and he dropped the fuel tank, but he stayed in the airplane. And I think there was a gentleman in here that was telling me he saw it when he was about 14. I can't remember who that was. Oh, yeah. And, and he came in like this and he managed to get over the village and over to Pearls Hill. He hit the ground here and it bounced 300 feet and landed there. It was a fatal accident. He never survived. He never ejected. He never ejected because his only chance to eject was at number five. He never ejected so he got over the, 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 the village. Me interrupting. My grandfather in those days yeah. He was on the dust cart because I used to empty the dust cart. Yeah. It. And he would, he, he, they saw it land and they yeah. told him to get away from it because they wanted to try and pull the pilot out. Yeah. And they couldn't get anywhere near because of the heat. He because was, yeah. it was on fire, the fuel. Yeah, yeah they told me to get away. I remember that because it was my aunt's birthday. That day, so. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Um, and it's not the only one. If we do next. Here's parts that uh, Andrew Cox and Steve Thompson, you can see we've, we've named them there, parts that they brought to the museum. And that's Bill Swafford on New Year's Eve, the year before 1956, on New Year's Eve, just coming into 1957, the year he was going to die, um, celebrating. Uh, we have a memorial area in the museum. Um, so if we go next. And for World War II, there was 48 died. For this type of airplane, we know there was 10. Uh, we don't know about this airplane. We haven't finished our research on that yet, on the F-84. We don't know how many of them, but they crashed. There was another airplane called the T-33, and we know of some crashes of them out by Finchley Field. But uh, one of the most famous ones, uh, men that died, was Colonel Kelly. And there's a, a little memorial plaque to him down in Gosfield, not far from the primary school. Colonel Kelly was in a two-seater, um, one of these jets, and he was training another pilot, taking him out on a training flight. And on their way back from the North Sea, um, the cockpit filled up with black smoke, uh, something to do with the oil. Um, so when they called it in, um, they were told, you're going to have to ditch the airplane and eject. They ejected with it. He told the young pilot he was training to eject. Canopy came off. Pilot, that pilot got out and uh, he saw that they were heading straight for Gosfield Primary School. Colonel Kelly stayed in, he had two young children of his own and uh, he stayed in the aircraft. And again, he never ejected and he died when it crashed into the field instead of the school. So if we go next, <clears throat> and they carried nuclear bombs. I'm just doing about four clicks here. I'm gonna move quite fast now because I'm getting near my time. <clears throat> Pitching field, the CN, anybody CND in here? Were you marchers? And, you know, bind the bomb people? You know? There you go. And they did, this is one of the nuclear bombs that they would have had. That, that, not that they would have had, they did have that one there. In fact, uh, <clears throat> the gent that said me that we got these photographs from the 320th, they have their own website. So if anybody knows what that picture means, they'll get the humor in it. Is there's a film called Dr. Strangelove, and Dr. Strangelove sits on a nuclear bomb just like that, a rocket. And that's what he's doing. He's doing it on a real nuclear bomb. I, uh, well, there was a gentleman that uh, went to talk to the 416th this year, uh, done a Zoom call like this, and he was telling us one time, this bit here, 
when it was being loaded on the airplane, that got plugged into the airplane. It was the electronics. And it started to steam and hiss and make a whistling noise. And everybody around ran away from it, except for the engineers that knew how to do it. Not much point running away from it. It was going to go off. <laughs> yeah, you're going to get it. And it said that the battery had gone wrong and shorted itself out. So they managed to disconnect it and sort it. OK, next. Air shows. Talked to a couple of people tonight about air shows. And uh, the air shows are famous. Roger Leach who took this picture. It's a, a favourite picture of the air shows. Look how low that was. They wouldn't be allowed to do that today. 1953 to 1988, there was air shows. I'm sure many of you went to them or saw them. Yeah. <coughs> Next. 19, this is the 1988 air show, the last one that was there. And uh, look at the cars, up to 50,000 visitors. In fact, one newspaper article says 100,000, but you can't believe everything you read in the newspapers, can you? But there were generally about 60, 50 to 60,000 people. It's a lot of people to go, to go to the air show. Um, can we go next? And the ladies used to like to go and see the airplanes as well, as you can tell. If we do next, we'll see why the ladies were probably there. Because <laughs> 4,000, more than 4,000 of them married a GI, you know, and lots of them, some of them are, might be on here tonight, lots of them um, got married when they were there. 4,000 plus weddings <laughs> between 52 and 1996. And made the newspapers quite often stories about a uh, cartoon, a wedding a week at Weatherspoon. Okay, next. And um, they love to go to the dances at Weathersfield. You've got David Bowie there. This is actually before David Bowie was actually called Davy Jones at the time. And you've got Tom Jones, uh, Tommy Checker, Johnny Cash, Lulu was there a few times, Freddie and the Dreamers, the Small Faces, lots and lots and lots of what we've been told about um, different groups that were there. Next. The chapel's still there. That's the yeah, chapel as it is today. Making comments, yeah. Uh, yeah, the chapel as it is today. Uh, it still looks like this exactly. Uh, it's one of the places we asked to have as a museum in the future. Uh, not, they've made no decision as yet, but we'll ask again next week. Uh, a couple here, um, John and Laurie, came back on their 35th wedding anniversary. That uh, was by holiday Monday in August. Few years ago, and that's him in that chapel, getting married. See the curtains behind, and that's him when they came back on the 35th one. And he had two children and some grandchildren with them. Lots of visitors from America every week. 4,000 got married. That means 4,000 are related to people in this area. And you know, between Chelmsford, Ipswich, and, and, uh, and Cambridge, the triangle. There are 4,000 families that are connected to America. So they come back every every week. Um, like there was somebody here just the other week. And there's more asking to come. Next. <clears throat> there's lots of other types of airplanes there. The U-2 spy planes, the tank busters. And this is the airplane that ended it all for them. When they, got, when they were getting that one, the F-111, it was bigger and faster. And Stansted was being built in 1970. It was becoming an international airport, and they couldn't have the two runways clash with each other. So they moved to Upper Hayford. So if we go next, and that airplane never came. From 1970 to 1979, it became a standby airfield. And uh, the combat support uh, services, the 66, they looked after it in case it was never needed again in time of war, uh, 1970 to 79. In 79, though, the heavy engineering department, the Red Horse, they moved in. They fixed runways, and they fixed roads, and they did lots of engineering jobs. They did lots locally. We go next. Called themselves the Dirt Boys, or the Horsemen. You see them here. This is them. They threw the bells up in the uh, church at Finchon Field. Um, they dug out the pond for them at Pinchon Field. They did work on the Rick River Stour for the people in um, Sudbury. 
and all the villages, farms, they would make roads for the farmers, they would fix farms, they had lots of community work, all free. Next, <clears throat> Charge and Charlie was their, their mascot. Charge and Charlie, the rumor is that Charge and Charlie used to be a stallion, but the base commander's <laughs> wife, I was a bit embarrassed every time she drove past it. And she had her husband get them to get the welding kit out and cut, cut Charlie's private parts on. And the rumour is, or the legend is, that there's, that's gone back to America, the red horse. That's still there. I want to turn it into, into a, a memorial to all the men that died. The horse is back in America at their headquarters when they left in 1990. But his private parts are buried somewhere on the airfield. <laughs> so whether that's true or not, we might find out if they start digging it up. Next. And they left in 1990, July the 3rd to be exact. But actually the last ones closed the gate in August. And if we go next, the police moved in in 1991. They said, I came here then, um, but I don't want to stay here. And I got promotion and I went back home. I'm not local, by the way. I went back home to Scotland <laughs> and took 2000. Just a few clips, uh, two, two more. Yeah, that's it. Uh, this is the MOD police. We'll not talk too much about them. Let's move on. <laughs> They're all my favorite people at the moment. They've closed the museum down. Oh. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. 1944, the control tower. And, about four clicks, Pete. One more, yeah. And that's the control tower. There you go. And the MOD police locked that down in 2009, or the civil servants that worked for the MOD police. So it's not there anymore. What a wonderful control tower it was. But if we do another click, we have an excellent bottle builder at the museum, Graham. And Graham, um, it's made, he's, I think we've got 10 dioramas that he's made, um, these little models like this, complete with the cars and everything. He's got the police car there because that's a little story of his. He was a plane spotter and he used to plane, uh, do the plane spotting and he used to go right up to where the nuclear bombs were and they arrested him one day and took him in and took his camera and that's the Fanda car <laughs> taking him down to Braintree to lock him up. <laughs> until, until they checked out the photographs on his uh, camera. So that's there's little things in his dioramas. We would next see it from a different angle. We've actually got fire engines and models in there now as well. And next. <clears throat> so I said the SES were there. The SES were there um, at the mushroom farm and they flew with the RAF and the big airplanes and parachute did. And I didn't really look into them much or find out much. Then a cousin contacted me in 2017. I started the museum in 2015. 2017, a cousin contacted me and said, do you know our granddad, who was in the Black Watch, was also in the SAS? I said, well, I didn't know that. So if you click next, my granddad was the quartermaster, <coughs> lieutenant, and the SES of the mushroom farm at Weathersfield. Uh, how would that happen? And then there's me, I was at Weathersfield in, and up till 2000, 2000 to 2012. So there's a connection that I never knew I had till 2017. An amazing coincidence. There we go. I knew my grandfather, he didn't die till 1977. He never talked about the war. Uh, he talked a few things about after the war, and when he was in the army, he was a major, and he, he was there, he was a major up till oh, 1970, as it says there. So, but uh, he didn't talk about World War too much. Uh, he was in the SAS. Next, I just got to quickly go through here, John, uh, Pete, just to show people. So, we're going to go quite quick. We're going to go. This is the bomb dump where the nuclear bombs are stored, as, as it is today. Next. These are the hangars where the airplanes were in with the nuclear bombs on them. They're still there today. They're the last remaining hangars of that type in Europe. There was none in America. 
because this is for the Cold War, right? And they're still there as they were in 1970, exactly the same. And they're the last remaining ones. They're quite historic. There are some at other airfields, but they've been refurbished and they've had walls built on and barn doors put on them. Next. And that was the crew rooms there. Next. There are two big hangars up at Weathersfield, huge places, make a great skate park or a BMX park in there, or have a big band dance. Um, they're both locked up and sealed up now and shut down, likely to be demolished, I would expect. Uh, I, I was reading about uh, one of the airfields that was closed down just about a week ago, and the T2 hangar, it's called the Type 2 hangar, they, uh, from World War II, 1943, they were built, and they're being knocked down and they're being demolished. <laughs> Again, that's quite a historic building. Next, the briefing center was there from the Cold War. It was their cinema. We've got all the programs of all the films that they used to go and see there. Lots of stories. The kids that were there working, doing the popcorn machine and, and taking the tickets. Queues of servicemen outside. That's the cinema today. Closed, doesn't get used by anybody. You know, um, well, fantastic community uh, building that would be if they opened that up. To I did a talk in there once. The chief consul let me open up the museum, also asked me to do a talk at Weathersfield and I invite all the villages, um, Weathersfield, Gosfield, and Pinsherfield. And I did a talk in there once. Okay, next. There's a gym hall there. What our use could be doing? In fact, what we could be doing at our age, we could be playing badminton in there, couldn't we? Yeah. Uh, or basketball, if you're up for a game of basketball, anybody? Yeah. But that could be getting used, couldn't it? It's a great community film. Um, that was 1950s that was built. Okay, next. There's a bar up there, two bars. There's one on the other side as well, smaller bar. Um, our big barbecue area, it's all fenced up at the moment. It looks like it's going to get demolished very shortly. This is the museum. The museum had five buildings in it. If anybody ever managed to get up there and come and see us, uh, 600 visitors a year we had. It's closed now. doesn't look like that anymore because I'll have to take everything down and pack it away. I'm going to ask them again. I've been for three months. I've been asking them if I can have another building, if I can open up in April and they haven't answered me. I'm going to give them one more chance next week. And if not, I'm going to go to the press. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. OK, next. There's a school. It's got 13 classrooms like this. And it's got an assembly hall, a little theater. Uh, and they can play gym and basketball and things in there as well. 13 classrooms like this. Um, that'd be a great building to put. In some of those classrooms, you could put a museum in there because that's the condition it's in. Next, rare plants and animals. That's what's on that land as well. And I'm going to hand you over just for five minutes to Mark Hall from a group called Swap if we go next. Because they want to stop this prison being built. That's the size of the airfield that the prison will be. It's nearly half the actual airfield if you take out that. It's uh, 800 acres, and that's 47 acres or something like that. And if we go next, and Mark is a member of Swap for Rewilding. They don't want the prison built there. They, think, they don't think it's right. He's going to tell you why. And they would like to see some other use, community use um, for it. Okay, Mark? Very nice. Thank you very much for me towards the end of your uh, presentation, a brilliant presentation, um, a sage of knowledge. Um, last year, towards the end of last year, I was in the pub. Uh, and, sorry, you get my yeah. Towards the end of last year, uh, I was in the pub and somebody spoke to me and said that, um, and I heard uh, that the Ministry of Justice were doing a presentation in the village hall about a prison. What prison? Oh, well, everyone's been notified. All the surrounding areas have been notified of this prison. Well, we didn't get notified. Nothing got put through my letterbox. So I 
went to this meeting and uh, there was a young lad there, probably in his 30s, who was the architect. And I questioned and quizzed him about his knowledge of the area. Now, this was the principal designer for a prison that's going to hold three and a half thousand inmates. It's the largest prison in Europe. Uh, the only reason it's they, they contest that is because there's a prison in France that holds four and a half thousand people, but that's only because it's overpopulated. So this is the biggest, the only other prison of this size is in America. Uh, it's going to be one and a half kilometers in length, 50 feet high, and three miles in perimeter around the outside, lit up with lights. Um, to build the prison, it's going to take four years. Uh, we asked the prison uh, MOJ to tell us what roughly the traffic volumes would be through the area in that period. They wouldn't tell us, so we demanded to know because they wouldn't propose something unless they did know. And they built a prison half that size in Wellingborough, and the traffic there was around about 800 vehicles per day, heavy goods vehicles. So they estimate this would be around 12 to 1500 vehicles a day of trades, people, and heavy goods vehicles. The designated route for them coming into the prison is either through Finching Field, Civil Headingham, uh, or Weathersfield out towards uh, Shelford. Their preferred, when I asked this young lad uh, in terms of his knowledge of the area, he said he'd never been here before. He'd never driven around here before. First time he'd been, and he was in the dark, by the way, it was middle of winter. So that's what I'll drive you around and I'll take you around the villages so you can see this, the road structure. No, no, we're having surveys done. Wasn't interested, dismissive of that. Um, and then he said the proposed route for the heavy goods vehicles will be out of the airbase, Scorpions Lane, turn left, and then through Weathersfield to Civil Headingham. When they get to the church, they'll turn right, go around the church to the Sugarloaf here, turn left, and then go up onto the A road. That's 1,100, 1,200 vehicles a day coming that way, or down through Weathersfield, Shelford. Ludicrous, ridiculous, brainless idea that no one ever could consider that, you know, it, it may as well be in the middle of the English Channel because it's as accessible as it is there. So we decided that we need to do something. So we set up a group of people called Swap, Swap Airfield, Weathersfield Airfield Prison. We're not anti-prison. We've got to build prisons. What we are not happy about is the fact that they've just decided because this is a piece of land, which is historical. You've just spent an hour articulating about all of the history on it, that will be gone. They will have written, all that will be gone. They're going to completely demolish everything on that site. The runway will be taken up. Uh, and then, half, as you said, half the, the, the um, airfield, which you can see on there, will be the prison. The other, they've been very clever because what they've said is on the other half, that's got to be sold within the next five years. And they don't know what they're going to sell it for, but they've suggested it could be like commercial and housing. So then you had the volumes of traffic. In that prison, there'll be 1,500 staff. So every day, there's a shift pattern, three shifts. So 400 people will be coming and leaving, 400 people leaving and coming every day, day and night. So we said, no, we're not going to do that. So we, we went to the local council, parish council meeting, and we, we said we're going to form this group. Uh, and the parish council really said, we can't act upon this. You'll have to start doing something yourself. But we were persistent. We went to Weathersfield. We went to Finchingfield, uh, and then we got the parish council's buy-in, and they said, well, we can't act on this on our own. We're going to have to put a subcommittee together. So they formed WASC, which is Weatherfield Air Base Scrutiny Committee. So that is 10 parish councils now have, uh, have come together to say we don't want this prison, and they've put two representatives from each council. Some have put their precept uh, forward, so they've, some have put 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 pounds, to date, we've raised, SWAP have raised £14,000. Uh, and you say, well, what do we need that money for? Well, we've got to pay for the best legal team and the best professionals that we can do to stop this going ahead. Uh, they are lawyers, and lawyers cut on that cheap, £1,000 a day, uh, barristers, uh, people who can carry out uh, surveys of the area uh, and, and put a case together in terms of fighting the, the, the Ministry of Justice. So that we stop this prison going ahead. This will be a 10-year build program. So they'll build for four years, occupy the prison, leave it for two years, and then start the second phase of the prison over that next four-year period. So it'll be 10 years in total. 
we need we need the public's help. We've moved on quite quickly. We've got a website now which has just been launched. Um, there will be a click uh, to donate page on there shortly once with the bank account sorted out. All of the contributions that we get for this will be going towards uh, funds that we will pass on to uh, the uh, WASC acting on our behalf. They will employ the professionals. Uh, we've had a lawyer in QC on this, uh, looked at it so far, and he's absolutely 100% sure that we've done everything we can to date to uh, put a case forward to stop the proposal going forward. Um, so that is now with them. There's still a lot of work to do. If this goes to the next stage, uh, where they do put planning permission in, that's where the real hard work starts. Uh, it's not a lost cause. It's not a done deal. It can't be housing. They've already turned housing down. So all these people around here saying, well, our prison's better than a house or houses. The housing's gone. So it's what we can do with that, that piece of land up there, which would be great for the, for the entire community, for the fields community, the parish councils that surround this area. What a great public space that would be for, for the local, and a museum, for, for Rossi's museum. So we're just looking for support, and I'm astonished, you know, that I live, we live in the 21st century, but a lot of people don't have internet. They don't have the means of communication to be able to understand what's going on. Mm. Uh, and they purposely not, they're hoping that you guys don't hear about it. They're hoping you do nothing about it, because mm. it's easier for them to, to railroad it through. They've completely shut down all communication. They've stopped us now going on the airbase altogether. We're now not allowed, I'm certainly not allowed on anyway. They don't want me on there. Uh, we've been up there a few times, taking a few people. We've got a high net worth person uh, in Finchingfield uh, who doesn't want to be named. Uh, her net worth is somewhere in the region of 220 million, and she's prepared to put her money where her mouth is to help stop this going ahead. So every penny, every 50 pence, doesn't matter what it is, if, if you want to go on our website, there's a page there. It's a comprehensive website that can tell you all about the history of the airfield, it can tell you all about the wildlife on there. Yes, there's some rare species of birds on that site. Um, there's some rare plants up there as well, which will all be gone. That really is just, there's some leaflets over there. Uh, if you want to take a leaflet and there's a little picture of what the prison's going to look like. Uh, actually, it might be quite nice for a weekend stay because it's got ensuite bathrooms, it's got tennis court, it's got a fo football. Yeah, it's quite nice. It's got the garden, landscape gardens as well. So no bars on the windows, by the way. Very nice. Anyway, that's my speech over. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Cheers. Thank you very much for your um, great. If you want to have a, we've got some leaflets there. There's some ideas, but you know, it's not a case of just stop the prison that um, SWAP have got. It's what could you do that would be better for the community with the area? There's some great ideas over there. And I think having a good museum on it is, is one that I support. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we, we look forward to that. Do you know, the Americans went away because they thought the Cold War was over. And I think, as Jan said earlier, Something for us to think about when we're leaving here. The Cold War is not over, is it? The Cold War was never really over. And we know that now. And I uh, do feel for, I uh, do think about the people in Ukraine. Some of my friends in America um, have got, have been to Ukraine and have got people that they know over there. I know they're extremely worried about them, especially people that they know that are young families. Uh, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Ross, thank you so much for a wonderful, fascinating talk. Not most of it are completely new to me. Um, I think that, uh, as you say, the thing that comes over whenever we study history at any period, but particularly history that's still within living memory yeah. for some of us, is the human dimension of it. These guys yeah. lost their lives. Yeah. And uh, we should never, ever forget that when the, the uh, effort that they put in. I do hope that, uh, uh, I'm not sure, what, is it the Ministry of Defence that owns it presently? Yes. Have, yes. They, have they done a deal with yes. the Ministry of Justice? Yes. They've done a deal with the Ministry of Justice. So say you wanted to write to 
an official at either department, would it be the defence or the justice that you would write to, or both? <laughs> CC. You write the DIO, yeah. uh, who are the people that have been instructed to get rid of the land. Um, and they will obviously be successful. So. And but probably the best person to write to is your MP. If your MP gets enough people writing on well, that, that's it. he knows which And the other thing, thing is to raise the petition because you've only got to get 100,000 signatures and yeah. it's got to be discussed in Parliament. Yeah. There, is there is a petition. Because I, think, I think we'll see about that, Ali, but there is a petition online. And it's, I don't know how many people are on it at the moment, the petition to have it discussed in Parliament. About 1,700. You need, need another eight. Well, because people don't know. That's why the lady said, Is that all? It's because people don't know. People haven't really picked up on it yet. Okay. And I also think, I don't know whether you're in touch with the American yes, families because they are very big on Lest We Forget and, mm -hmm. and the war and the veterans and yes, everything, more so than we are, I think. And I'm sure they would help. I mean, I didn't touch on the historical part, but yeah. you know, that was. If you want to go, are you keen to get home, then please do. And thank you very much for coming. There are books to look at on the table. There's this display here to look at. And in the meantime, if you come through the left hand door, yeah, your left hand, uh, we'll try and get you some tea or coffee and biscuits. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Sonny's asking, Sonny's asking online there, are the houses still there? Yes, there's 150, 150 houses still there, built in 1959, the American quarters. Some of them, uh, probably about 50, are going to be demolished and have new houses built on top of, uh, of that land. But the army live there now, and they live in about 80, 90 of the houses. so what we were doing was we were coming down yeah. uh, yeah. the teacher was describing it wasn't like the, was, the team was coming out the back the SDS were jumping off the gun and started to Are you that one? Go around, come back, drive the jeep up, put my own raid on the tech. Are we going to be meeting again at some point? Are we going to be meeting again at some point? Yeah, no, Morris, Morris was in the icon department. Yeah, no, Morris was in the office.